Well, welcome all you wiretappers out there. I'm getting ready to start on a multi-part series, and this is episode number one, about the most famous murders that ever took place. The murder of Maximum John Woods, the Texas John Wood, who gave such draconian sentences that everybody knew him as Maximum John. Now, we all know a little bit about that story. We have a flamboyant drug dealer, his lawyer brother, a crusading district attorney, hanging judge, and the father of a famous movie star, Woody Harrelson. Charles Harrelson was his name. So it's a heck of a story. And I have been all over the place trying to research this. My main source has been this book here, Dirty Dealing. So if you're really interested in this and want to go into it in really in depth, this book here is good by Gary Cartwright. Anyhow. The 1979 murder of Western District Court of Texas Judge John Wood, a.k.a. Maximum John, became the single most expensive investigation ever conducted by the FBI since the JFK assassination. I mean, they pulled out all the stops, and I've seen them do it here in Kansas City. We had an FBI agent that was killed in a street crime. He was here on a special assignment of some kind. He's walking back to his hotel and somebody kills him, and it turns out it was a street robbery that went wrong. They brought in agents and equipment and from all over the United States. It was amazing, and the homicide squad, of course, started hitting the local drug dealers and street thugs and all that, and they came up with the suspect pretty quick. But during this investigation, to give you some idea of how huge it was, they collected over 500,000 pieces of information, conducted 30,000 interviews, and had hundreds and hundreds of hours of recorded conversations. Now, can't ever find any of those conversations, or I'd have some of them. I'm not going to have any of them. In the end, the government will convict Charles Harrelson, Woody Harrelson's dad, of being the trigger puller. And they'll convict Harrelson's wife for obtaining the murder weapon. They traced her to buying the murder weapon and receiving some of the money. And they'll convict Jimmy Chagra's brother, Joe Chagra, for conspiracy in this, and the wife of Jimmy Chagra, Elizabeth Chagra, for bringing the money, conveying the money, I think $250,000 to the wife of the hitman, Charles Harrelson. But the mastermind behind this plot, this marijuana smuggler, Jimmy Chagra, he got a not guilty. And he hired the most famous mob lawyer at the time, Las Vegas mob lawyer Oscar Goodman, and it was Goodman's biggest win ever. You can't even imagine how many cases he got after that. Everybody had went through the criminal underworld like wildfire, and they said, hey, Goodman's the guy that can get you off. He got Jimmy Chagger off after everybody else got convicted in this thing. He can work magic. So get ready for the ride, folks, because I'm going to take you down something that has many twists and turns through the most seamiest of seamy underbellies I've ever encountered in the Southwest Texas underworld. I tell you what, they got some criminals down there in Southwest Texas. Let's start back to 1960s. The 1960s counterculture, if you remember, many of you are of an age, that counterculture, those young people, the baby boomers, freshly back from Vietnam and in college and they demanded marijuana. Well, there was a descendant of a Lebanese immigrant named Jimmy Chagra or Jamil Chagra. He was growing up in El Paso, Texas. He started smuggling this marijuana. His brothers, Joe and Lee Chagra, both went to law school and practiced criminal law in El Paso, which made a nice kind of like a real fit there. Lee Chagra will go on to become the go-to lawyer in the southwest part of the United States for drug smugglers and really throughout the South. He got quite a reputation because he won a big case up in Tennessee. Now, Richard Nixon started this war on drugs, if you remember right. And when he started, a lot of people felt called to do it. I guess I was called to fight in the war on drugs in many ways. There was a private attorney named James Kerr who was in a successful private practice, but he, again, was called. He felt like he was called into this war and he got a job with the U.S. Attorney's Office and he worked for the federal U.S. Attorney down in Texas and he was assigned to the court overseen by Judge John Wood, Maximum John. Jimmy Chagra is bubbling up to the top of the DEA hit list by this time because he had this really larger than life personality. He was just out there. Everybody knew him. 
He had these enormous gambling habits in Las Vegas. Everybody in Las Vegas knew him. And hey, he, all that money comes from drug smuggling. This is a tip to all you budding big time criminals. Keep a low profile, dudes. Don't go out and be the most flamboyant guy ever. I do a pretty successful criminal here in Kansas City. And when you saw him in Kansas City, he, he wore overalls. He drove about a 10 or 15 year old beater looking car. He didn't flash a lot of anything around. But when you talk to him, you realize this was not who you thought it was. And he told me when he was out of town, he'd often rent a Rolls Royce and wore all the best clothes and had a some kind of a cabin down in Arizona and then had a place out in Las Vegas and outside of Las Vegas. But he knew how to keep a low profile where law enforcement might be paying attention to him. Jimmy Chagger did not know how to do that. And on this story, it also has not only the murder of a U.S. federal court judge, but this assistant U.S. attorney, James Kerr, there was an attempted murder of him. And Lee Chagra, Jimmy Chagra's brother, the famous, he was known as the Black Prince, this famous drug lawyer will get killed. And of course, the murder of John Wood and the arrest of Jimmy Chagra in this big investigation. That's like the overview I want to start with El Paso. That's where this all started in El Paso. El Paso can be just as much a character in this story as these individuals. Has a long reputation. Anybody's ever been in around El Paso, especially back then, it was still a real Wild West kind of town. And Juarez was a Wild West kind of a town, too. I went there when I was a young man. Of course, we went over to Juarez. We drove our car over to Juarez and just parked it and went into a couple of, of joints. And <laughs> shall we say prostitution was wide open. But they also wanted to just rip you off and not do anything either. I don't know if any of you guys ever been down there and experienced that, but it's a different world, especially for a greenhorn like me from Plattsburgh, Missouri, when I was 17 years old down in Juarez was, they took me for some money. I didn't have any money to speak of, but what I had, they got from me. It has a long checkered history. It was a Spanish built mission in 1659. It's that old. El Paso del Rio Grande del Norte, or the Pass of the Great River of the North. And it became a really important trading center on the South Bank. And that became known as Ciudad Juarez. And after Sam Houston and the other settlers fought off the Mexican troops and formed the nation of Texas, Missouri merchants start splitting off from the Santa Fe Trail, going to Santa Fe and taking trade goods down to Juarez and then on into Mexico, because Mexico then was a separate country from Texas, and on south to Chihuahua City. And there was all kinds of smuggling going on back and forth, and there was bounty hunters for Apache scalps and gamblers and adventurers, and they all found a kind of a home in either Juarez and the border in El Frontera, in El Paso or Juarez. Of all the Old West cities, El Paso continued to maintain the reputation of being a wild city on into modern times. Director of U.S. Customs back in the 60s and 70s once said if they stopped all smuggling through El Paso, the economy on both sides of the border would collapse. It was such an important area that DEA made El Paso the center of all their nationwide intelligence gathering about the international narcotic smuggling operations. And I remember the DEA had this whole center where all their analysts were, and I don't know what all went down there. I knew a guy that got transferred up to Kansas City that came out of the El Paso Intelligence Center down there. So the 1970s drug scene, as we all know, those of us of a certain age, there was a never-ending war on drugs, started during the 1970s under Dick Nixon, and they had draconian laws to deal with, especially with kingpins. Drug organizations, they called kingpin, they were called kingpin laws. He formed the agency after the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which if you remember, you've heard me say this before, it was the only one really paid any attention to the mafia long before the FBI did, but they were reformed into a new agency called the Drug Abuse Law Enforcement, or DALE, or ODALE, Office of Drug Abuse Law Enforcement. You know, these government agencies, they change around their acronyms all the time. Then it was renamed the DEA. And they were the first ones to really form task force with local police because you're taking college guys and sticking them into fighting international drugs. Well, you needed to have guys from each big city who had been on the streets. So they recruited some, recruited a lot of people out of college because they had a requirement of a college degree. 
but they found some local policemen who had worked drugs. And we had some here in Kansas City that had worked narcotics and had a college degree and went to work with Dale. But just in Kansas City, they took eight or 10 guys that were assigned to narcotics or tactical response units that worked narcotics and took them in as special assignments to Dale or drug abuse law enforcement. And the stories that filtered back from those guys were crazy. They took these young guys, these street guys, and gave them a budget and sent them around the Midwest to do drug operations, drug things. And <laughs> they were getting into shootouts. They got caught fraternizing with informants, female informants, of course, spending the government money like there was no tomorrow. <laughs> they were really operating with very little adult supervision, but they were pretty effective. I remember making this one call. I was a district guy, and he's a well-known heroin dealer, lived in my district. I got this call to meet the, I think it was a Dale agent. So over there, I get there, and I see this one guy that I knew was half nuts. Anyhow, I was a Kansas City policeman. He's now assigned to Dale. The drug dealer's car, I knew his car. I talked to him a couple of times and stopped him on the street and just jacked with him in general. And he was in his car, and this guy gives this maniacal laugh. I said, what do you need here? He said, secure the house. I said, we're taking him in, and we're taking his car. This is our car now. They just laughed like hell and took off. And there I am just standing there, and house is wide open. <laughs> Nobody in there. <laughs> know what to do i called the sergeant over and i think we just shut the door and locked it and drove off they were crazy buddy they were crazy but you had to be a little bit goofy to do that so that's just my own little personal interaction with dale that's the people that were going after jimmy chagra and jimmy chagra the man at the center of all this he was born and raised in this wild west city of el paso his grandparents as I said before, from Lebanon and Syria and that Middle Eastern area, and then immigrated to Mexico around 1900. And actually, his father, his grandfather, Joseph, had joined up with Pancho Villa in that Juarez border area and ended up getting arrested by the federales. He bribed the guards, and he and his wife escaped and went north of the border and started working in and around El Paso. His original name was actually Bujada, but they changed it to Chagra for some reason. It worked to Abjads. He was even a sheriff's deputy for a while. He started a produce stand across the street from the courthouse. He was a hustling kind of guy. He ended up going into the Middle Eastern, he went up going into the rug business. I mean, you know, how much more of a stereotype can you get? 1944, by the end of the war, Abdu Chagra and his wife, Josephine, had three sons. Lee Chagra was the oldest, and then Jamil or Jimmy Chagra, and then the youngest was Joe Chagra. He was a rug merchant by then, and Jimmy was on his way to be a drug smuggler. He tried going in the carpet business. The oldest brother, Lee and Joe, were pretty bright, and they went on to college, and they were going to college. Well, Jimmy wasn't a college kind of guy. He was a hustler. He was just more of a street guy. He was not very nice unless he needed something from you. His parents, they really put a lot of effort into getting this carpet store going, and they wanted to turn it over to him. They wanted him to be in the carpet business. They had a store motto, a floor without a rug is like a kiss without a hug. <laughs> it was pretty tricky, huh? But his inattention really ended up driving into bankruptcy. He did not have the attention span it took to run a legitimate business like that. He was verbally abusive. Really, he was a gambler is what he was. He was a degenerate, abusive, sick, addicted gambler. And as a complainer, too. And he pouted when he didn't get his way. Unless he needed something from you, and then he could be charming as hell, and people would always forgive him. Started running a floating blackjack game, and he started making a lot of trips to Vegas. El Paso is not that far from Vegas. Pretty soon, he's like starting to come up with money and having lots of money, lots of gold jewelry, nice cars, had a Lincoln Continental back in the day. He was taking private jet trips to places like up to Vegas and back. And he didn't have any actual job. I said he'd been running some kind of a card game, floating card game, but that wasn't where this money was coming from, this kind of money. This was putting him right on a direct collision path with this federal judge, Maximum John Wood. Now, best I can tell from my research, how he got started in this drug business was in the 1960s. He got a phone call from an old buddy of his, Pete Kretschewski. That's kind of a hard one to sell, Kretschewski. Pete had served two tours in Vietnam 
and he'd been a Cobra helicopter pilot. I had a friend that did that, became a warrant officer and became a Cobra pilot and flew over there for, I don't know, 18 months or so, came back and <laughs> he was PTSD and all over the place, but he finally got himself straightened out and ended up having a really good long career as an engineer at the Ford plant. But anyhow, these Cobra pilots, and my friend was one of these, he was a maverick kind of a guy. I used to drink a lot with him, as you might well imagine. Maverick kind of guys, and they were bold. This guy, Pete, had been awarded most of the awards for valor. I think he had actually would have awarded, been awarded, if I remember right, the most awards for valor of any Cobra pilot during the war. He comes back home, he can't find a job. There's a lot of out-of-work helicopter pilots. So Pete... He hears about this marijuana smuggling. He's got these flying skills and he's bold. And he gets with Jimmy, who's got a lot of connections down on the border. And they go into business together, smuggling marijuana with airplanes, with light planes. Jimmy had the border connections and Pete had the flying skills. And the Chagger brothers, and Lee particularly by this time, was a successful criminal defense lawyer. And so he knew all the drug dealers. And so it was like this perfect storm and perfect grouping of people. It's a new business smuggling from Mexico in 1968, 69. If you think about it, I know what you guys are doing back then. But this good marijuana, you had to be out in California or somewhere down the southwest to get it. The stuff we had up in the Midwest was uh, barely had any THC in it. Some people were able to bring it back up. They went on a trip to Jamaica sometimes, but just wasn't a huge demand for good pot, but there just wasn't the supply out there yet. And these guys realized that, and they started filling that demand for the really good pot from the Mexican pot, which at the time was the cat's meow. It'll get overtaken by Colombian eventually, but at first, it was a Mexican. People that wanted pot discovered this higher quality weed that come from Mexico, and they wouldn't buy the other ditch weeds, we used to call it. They didn't want to buy that. They wanted this Mexican pot. I remember people used to come to the Midwest and harvest the ditch weed because we had it growing all over the place. Because back in the 1800s, they had hemp growing all over the place. And so the seeds had continued. They grew along railroad right and fence rows and other places. I remember on our farms up home, some places where you didn't mow, like in certain corners and some areas where you couldn't get a mower into or you just didn't pay attention to it, it would be overgrown with pot, which because they had grown hemp out there on that farm back in the 1800s. People come to the Midwest and harvest that, but what they were doing, sometimes they would sell it and People didn't really like it particularly, but what they were doing is then they were getting the more expensive marijuana, uh, more expensive Mexican or Jamaican marijuana and diluting it down with this ditch weed from the Midwest, tripling their money, so to speak, just like you'd take any kind of mixer or any kind of like cornstarch and stick it in with your cocaine and make more money out of it. Well, Jimmy had made a Mexican connection, and they rented a plane. First load that we can trace to them, they went down. They got 700 pounds of grade A Mexican weed. And that they had a connection already, and they delivered it to a group of what they described as trust fund hippies up in Aspen. They cleared $85,000 on this one transaction. I mean, that was more than enough to buy that plane and have a lot of money left over. Jimmy Chagger would never look back after that. I mean, Jimmy and Pete and a band of renegades that came together down in this El Paso area became the largest marijuana smugglers in the world for a period of time. Their little empire, Jimmy and Pete, grew to a fleet of six planes and four freighter ships. They basically owned the prime minister of the Bahamas, a guy named Lyndon Pending by this time. So they get their ships safe passage through the Bahamas. They were paying off DEA officials and border cops. And when there's that much money, you can buy a lot of goodwill with that kind of money, and especially when it's drug smuggling and there's no direct violent crime attached. You can corrupt a lot of people. They say he even made a deal with Raven Patriarca up in Massachusetts and Providence because he wanted to unload his ships along the Massachusetts coastline because the DEA, by now they're gone from Dale to DEA, they were really hardening the target. They're putting up a lot of radar and putting a lot of resources into Florida and along the border. 
loading up these ships and bringing them out into the Atlantic and north and then back into the har and along the coastline up in Massachusetts and unloading them. And the next person we hear from in this second part of the series is be a guy that was intimately involved in one of those operations. So now by the later 70s and early 1980s, Mexican weeds kind of out. They were not really staying up with the times. Colombians were making all that money out of cocaine and they really got professionally into the drug business and they started developing weed that had a much higher THC and Colombian, the fine Colombian as a Steely Dan song says, starts becoming the weed of choice. Well, Jimmy Chagra, it was a good businessman in that area and, and he stayed on top of the market and was watching trends and pretty soon the trend is People want Colombian weed. So the way I've read it, what my research tells me, he just cold went down to Colombia and he ended up asking around. He made a Colombian connection. And the smuggling business became even more lucrative because these Colombians, they were on a professional level growing weed, much more than the Mexicans had been. And what they were doing was they were fronting it. They were happy to front it. Now, you would owe them, but they were happy to front a million, two million, three million dollars worth of weed if you would take it and then come back with the money and build up a little bit of a reputation. And Jimmy Chagra had a reputation of always holding up his end of the bargain already. Now, when Jimmy Chagra wasn't smuggling marijuana, he had this huge appetite for action. He was in Las Vegas gambling like crazy, gambling his head off. Now, in that book that I talked about, Dirty Dealing, the author, Gary Cartwright, wrote this about Jimmy, he said he had a gambler's instinct and was fatalistic about winning or losing. Glenn Craps, he'd put 10 grand on the pass line. If he got a number, he'd put 10 more behind the line, 10K on the come. If he got another number, he'd put 10K on that number, another 10K on the come. As long as he kept the dice, he just kept putting it out on the next number that came up. And he might run through a million dollars in five minutes one way or the other. They knew him well in Las Vegas, believe me, and he had carte blanche when he was there. They said that he stayed in the Sinatra suite, and even supposedly, one story is that Frank Sinatra wanted to stay in the Sinatra suite, and Jimmy Chagra was there, so they made him stay somewhere else. They knew him as a guy that would bring in footlockers filled with cash, just hand it to the casino cashiers to count it and deposit it in his account. Of course, this was before the cash transaction records of CTR law. But that's how they were washing their money back in those days. Now, in 1975, Jimmy Chagra teams up with two other El Paso smugglers named Jack Strickland and Mike Halliday. And they put together the biggest pot smuggling adventure known to man at the time. And they never got caught on it. I don't know how much money they all made on it. And I know a little bit of how much they made on it. Because we'll find out in my next episode. It's going to be an interview with Hermit Swedell or Kim Swidell, who it was, he's known as today, who took part in that operation. He wrote a book all about it titled Folly Cove, and it goes into great detail about this smuggler's dream of an operation. I mean, it was a dream of an operation. Now, the proceeds from the Folly Cove operation and the myth around it being so successful and how they did it, that made Jimmy Chagra into a legend among drug smugglers at the time. And we all know when the government thinks criminals are becoming a legend, you know what's going to happen then. When hubris appears, nemesis comes along and they take them down. The government's the nemesis, of course. So come back to this next episode and we're going to go inside of the largest known pot smuggling adventure known to the public. And we know it because they did eventually get arrested for it and they did talk and now we've got a book about it too, Folly Cove. So thanks a lot, guys, and don't forget, I like to ride motorcycles. That's my biggest adventure anymore. So look out for motorcycles when you're out on the road, and if you have a problem with PTSD, be sure and go to that VA website. And if you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, our friend Anthony Ruggiano is down there in Florida, has, works in a treatment center, and if you'll go to his website, anthonyruggiano.com or Reformed Gangsters or something, just search for Anthony Ruggiano on YouTube and you'll find it. And if you're on YouTube, you can see the hotline number. Anyhow, use Anthony Ruggiano. I mean, it could be a big help to you.
And last but not least, don't forget to like and subscribe and give me a review and keep coming back, folks. We've got more stories for you. Thanks a lot, guys.